so happy. First of all, I'm really happy that all of you guys are here, so thank you so much for showing up. I mean, it's really easy for you to show up on Friday morning and Friday night. First of all, we're feeding you. Second of all, it's Magalas. Third of all, let's face it, Friday night. We're bringing the house down with the powerhouse. So thank you so much for everybody coming. I really appreciate it. Um, I don't know where, they're all back there. They just flew in, they, so they should be coming out any minute now, but we're gonna get going. So here's my hope for you guys this weekend. My hope for you is how many of you guys have been saved for a while? Awesome. How many of you guys are newly saved? Awesome. I love it. How many of you got newly saved here at Foundation Church? Even better. And how many of you guys want absolutely nothing to do with God? And you are forced here by somebody. And you're too chicken to raise your hand. Been there, done that. I know what that's like. So if you've been saved for a while, sometimes you get stuck. Have you ever heard of the term saved and stuck? Yeah, sometimes we get saved and stuck. Sometimes we get saved and we were never, we didn't even get stuck because we never really did anything. Come on in, my friends. That's right. Woohoo! A pastor, you dress for the occasion. Great minds. So I was telling them, I have a lot of people here for me, which is shocking. We got the comedian tomorrow morning. Yeah, that's right. Don't, she's a ham. She's a ham. See, like, when I asked her to preach last year, she was like, I don't really do that. And she got up there and she stole the stinking show. She made me look bad. So, and then we got Elijah or Elisha, whoever you want. She's preaching on Friday night. Um, so, I will tell you this. So I think it was like two weeks ago, I sent you a DM and I said, girl, like things are like <laughs> for you. And you said, thank you, woman of God. And I, th I almost wrote back to you. I'm like, listen, I don't need Jesus to tell me that. Like, like it, you have to be brain dead not to see where God's taking you. You know, like it's all a natural thing that you can visually see, but God is gonna like, you're in the next girl. I really believe that in my spirit as far as like, you look at, I'm not saying Catherine Kuhlman, all these other, you know, Maria Eder and stuff like that. I'm not saying that. God has his own thing for you. But you are going after it. This year, 21 days, no food, only water. That's somebody who is chasing after what God has for them and is willing to do whatever it takes to get there. And I am so stinking proud of you. I cannot tell you. I'm so stinking proud of you. Yeah. Amazing thing. But that's, a, again, a new thing. Like, that's not new for her, but for us, what is new for us? We get, again, we get saved and stuck sometimes. We never even get, we get saved, but then we don't really even do anything with it. We look the same, we talk the same, we are the same, right? That is not God's plan or intention for us. His thing is for you to be a new creature in Christ. Okay, now listen, I have so much stuff to go over with you guys that, like, my book I plan on getting through it. So if we get out of here at midnight, if you hear screaming at 10.30, that's Tom. <laughs> I'm not kidding you. He's doing his podcast and he doesn't stop until 10.30. If you hear lots of screaming, nobody's being killed. <laughs> He's very passionate. A lot of us are needing new health, new wealth, right? New relationships. I'm not talking about new relationships with necessarily opposite sex. I'm talking about new relationships, friendships. Like some of us are so lonely and we don't know what to do with that. And you would kill for just one good friend. But God has multiple friends for you. I mean, it's great to have one good friend, but I say, um, somebody asked on the podcast one time to me, How, do you want, would you love one good friend or would you love many friends? Like a one best friend or many friends. I choose many friends because you can do a lot of things with a lot of people. But when it's just you and someone else, and what if that person leaves you? You're screwed. So, and people will leave you. They will leave you. Trust me on that. COVID proved that big time. 
Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, I just come to you right now, and I thank you for every single woman in this room. Father God, I ask, just like Pastor Rodney always says, that you do not walk in the same way and leave the same way, that you walk out the same, I mean, you walk in a person and you're changed when you walk out. Never the same again in Jesus' name. And Father God, I just thank you. I ask that eyes be open that ears hear something, and when they hear it, they're not only a hearer, but they're a doer of the word. That we practice what we hear, and we become all that you've called us to be. And that, Father, a little light bulb goes off tonight over our heads and says, Lord, I never knew that I was to be all these things. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen. Amen. So, I mentioned COVID because have you ever... This is what you don't want to be, okay? Have you ever had a friend that you just knew, like, they were so strong spiritually that they said all the right things, they did all the right things, they were strong in the Lord. They would approach a situation and they would always, no matter how hard it was, they would do the right thing. Even if that meant that the person they were were saying it to or whatever would reject them, They stood to their convictions, their biblical convictions. And then all of a sudden, they become enlightened. And so all the things that the word says, they go and they do the opposite of it because it's no longer popular. It's very woke. How many of you guys can say that you know people like that? I've been devastated. I'll be honest with you. It's happened to me three times with three very close friends. And I would tell you, there was no way in heaven that they would ever go that way. But they did. And there by the grace of God, God go we, right? Because if you don't stay on it, you'll fall for the same ploys and the same things. So you always should be coming something new. So I was with a friend today, and they said to me, you are so different this year than you were last year. What a compliment. Because seriously, we, you, some people are always offended by that. They're like, I should have been better than I am right now. Yeah, you should have been. <laughs> Absolutely. Because that's what God calls us to be. Every single day, evolving and changing into the perfect image that he has for you, which is his image. So every day, we should be evolving into what he looks like. And I can tell you right now, I look nothing close to him. And most of us in this room, as beautiful as some of you are, neither do you. We should not look the same as we did yesterday, last week, last month, always being a new vessel, a new creature in Christ, right? So how do we start? I'm going to tell you something. Jeremiah 1.5 says, before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Before you were born, I sanctified you. So before you were ever brought on this earth and put in your mother, God knew you. He knew every single one of you. But then it goes on to say, before you were born, I sanctified you. What is the definition for sanctified? It's made holy, set apart, and consecrated. How powerful is that? Each and every single one of us. Turn to Psalm 139, 14 through 16. I hope you brought your Bibles. If you did not, learn to bring your Bible. It's very important. That's the reason why we gave a bunch away tonight. Study to show yourself approved. A workman that needeth not be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. It says do not read it. It says to study the word. Da- David wrote this psalm, and let's remember, David was a murderer and adulterer. He was not a good guy. He was a man after God's own heart, though. And he knew who he was, even in the midst of his sin, when he was doing things right and when he was doing things wrong. He knew who he was in Christ, and the reason, or in God. And the reason why he did that is because he was contrite, meaning he was repentant. He didn't live like that and just expect God to, to deal with it. No, he lived like that, knew that he needed to fix it, and he needed to be right with God. It's not the way we live today. A lot of people are like, take me as I am. And God's saying, that's not what I said, and that's not going to work. It's not going to work. Psalm 139, 14 through 16 says, I will praise you. I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Marvelous are your works. And I love this last part because there's one of my favorite songs that sings this. And that my soul knows very well. You can know it in your heart and you can know it in your head. But when you know it in your soul, 
And that my soul knows very well. My soul knows that I am fearfully and wonderfully made, that I am marvel marvelous are your works. That's what our souls, David knew that, and he had committed the most grievous of things. He killed one of his top men, one of his top soldiers who defended his life, and then he took his wife. So, I want to tell you something about you. <clears throat> the following things about our human body, you need to, I'm going to explain them to you because I feel like how God made each and every single one of us is mind-blowing, but it just shows how important each and, of, each and every single one of us are. It says, um, the acid in the human stomach is strong enough to dissolve zinc. I drink soda, so I'm pretty safe. <laughs> Everybody tells me, you can't drink soda because of, you know, how it burns, like you pour soda on something and it totally dissolves that, whatever. I can drink soda. That proves it right there. <laughs> but the strong acid does not eat the stomach itself. Yeah, so feel free, indulge. <laughs> drink whatever the heck you want. The lungs contain more than 300 billion capillaries, which are small blood vessels, which if laid out end to end, would stretch 1,500 miles. You're important. Human bone, this is a human bone. Human bone is strong as granite in support weight. One block of bone the size of a matchbox can support nine tons. I can, contest, I can attest to this, ladies. I've been on a workout regime. I've been losing some weight, and these bones have been holding up some mighty pounds. My holiday weight did not leave for a really long time. About 40 pounds of skin cover the human body. Each kidney has one million individual filters. The muscles causing the eye to focus move about 100,000 times a year. God is amazing. We are not like an explosion. We are fearfully, wonderfully made. The average, in 30 minutes, the average body gives off enough heat, which I can prove when I had hot flashes, it gives off enough heat combined to bring one half gallon of water to boil. How many of us can attest to that too? Yeah. That's pretty awesome, except when you're going through a hot flash. God cares about you, 100%. Psalm 144.12, turn to that, please. Now let's talk about ladies. I hear the turning. Psalm is in the Old Testament. We were just there talking about David, a few inches, I mean, a few chapters. That our sons may be as plants grown up in their youth, that our daughters may be as pillars sculpted in palace style. Do you know back in the um, biblical times or in Roman times, they would take ladies figures and they would sculpt them and they would be pillars? And actually the word sculpted, or excuse me, the word pillar, um, pillars actually means cornerstone. Jesus was called the cornerstone. Men produce seed and fruit. Women, we're to be the cornerstone of our families, okay? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take you to understand your importance in the home, your importance in ministry, your importance to yourself so that you can be successful. You need, everybody needs, I've been in, in life at times where I'm like, is this all there is? How many of us can relate to that? Is this all there is? This isn't all there is. Just open up that word, and new, new life comes to it. So when they, were t when they talk about the pillar and the cornerstone, women are designed, and it's not always the case, but women are to be the cornerstone of the family so that when tough times come in, we hold it up. That's our job. The man goes to work, and he, and he you know, women do too now, but... That wasn't the way it was truly designed. The man was to go, he was to produce um, the food and the, bring in the, the, the harvest and things like that. But women are to be the cornerstone of the home so that when he gets home, everything is intact. Everything is perfect, right? That's our job. There's something beautiful about being that support mechanism to that man. But in that, there's strength in that. You're not just behind the scenes. You're actually holding things up. It's super important. But remember, 
Jesus was called the cornerstone. And what an honor for us to be called that as well. So how many of you guys say, I, I can walk by faith, but then you use the words, but or what if? You know, it's really easy to sit there and say, I can do all these things, but what if? We've all been there. Turn to Numbers 131. You remember when uh, God, and Tom just preached about this, but, but all of us sit there and we, 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 we can look at ourselves and we can say, I, can, I love what you're saying and I would love to be the cornerstone for my family. Or maybe you're not, you don't have a family. Maybe you're not married. Maybe you're single or whatever. Um, I would love to be new. I would love to have new things, but I don't know how to get there or I don't have confidence in myself. A lot of us deal with a lot of self-esteem issues, right? We don't feel confident in who we are. I can honestly tell you that I felt like that in 10th grade. And then somebody ticked me off and I lost that emotion completely. I said, never again. Never again. I will never let anybody own me or have authority over me. Right? I became very confident in myself, and I said, if nobody likes it, that's okay. I like me. It'll be fine. And that's, I'm not saying that you need to be exactly like that, but you do need to be like that. You need to be a person that says, I can do all things through Christ, right? I don't need anybody else because as long as I got you, I'm good. But here's the thing. If you go to number, uh, Numbers 131, 10, that, you know, God had promised the land of Canaan to the Israelites. 12 go in, 10 come out with a negative report. Even though they walk out with a cluster of grapes, they say that it's flowing with milk and honey, they have uh, pomegranates and figs, okay? But they say, we can't do it. And then two guys say, oh yeah, we can do it. Because they believe what the word of God said about them. They believed that God said, I promised you that. I'm going to take it for you. You got this. They believed in who they were in God. If you look at Numbers 131, it says, we are not able to go up against the people. They are stronger than we. And then Numbers uh, Numbers 133 says, there we saw the giants, and we were like grasshoppers in our own sight. They didn't believe what God said about them. They believed what they said about themselves. We don't look at what the world says about us or the world's opinion of us, and we don't look at the devil's opinion of us. We look at the opinion that God says about us. Um, let me go ahead. So let me move on, because I'm ahead of myself. I'm going to write some scriptures down. Romans 8.31 says, If God be for us, who can be against us? Romans 8.37 says, We are more than conquerors. Philippians 4.13 says, we can do all things through Christ. Am I going too fast? God bless. Romans 8.31. If God be for us, who can be against us? See, if, if the, um, they didn't have this, like the Israelites didn't have this, but they actually heard the voice of God. We have a, a superior, they have an inferior covenant, but they still heard the voice of God and they still believed and doubted. We don't have to. We have what Paul said to the, to Rome, in Romans. If God be for us, who can be against us? Victory is ours. Romans 8.37, we are more than conquerors. Victory is ours. Philippians 4.13, we can do all things through Christ. John 1.4, greater is he that is in me than in he that is in the world. Amen. Amen. Now, I will tell you, like, this doesn't necessarily work when you're trying to work out and you're trying to do it by yourself. I don't do well with that. Sometimes you do have to have a group of people around you to help keep you accountable, right? That's why friendships and church are super important. They keep you accountable, they keep you strong, but the word is really what we go to every single time. Every single time it'll keep you accountable and it'll keep you strong. Second Corinthians 5.17, you going there? Begin to look at what God says about you. And this is where we begin. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. All things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. You are new. If you have said yes to Jesus and you said, I want you to be Lord of my life, you are a new creature in Christ. And what you have to do is begin renewing your mind. 
getting rid of what the lies that maybe your family and friends and people have said over you and spoken about you and start renewing your mind to what the word, what God says about you. If Jesus, if God sent his only son for you and then Jesus said, yes, I will for you. And then the Holy Spirit said, I will dwell with them for a really long time for you. You are priceless. You have value. Never doubt that. And don't let anyone ever speak anything other than that than that in your life. It will hold you back and you will never do what God's called you to do. It'll be a distraction. So how many of you guys want to be a new you for your family? Amen. Me too. Romans 16, 12 through 15. Let's go there. I made a list. In order to renew your mind, we have to start by being honest about ourselves. Okay? How many of us are temperamental? Do you know what temperamental means? When things don't go your way, you act like the two-year-old toddler that you raised. You get on the floor and you pitch a fit and you work it until you get your way. Okay, being temperamental, Jesus is not temperamental. God is not temperamental. Yes, otherwise we'd be in big trouble. How he behaves is how we behave. There's no room for being temperamental because when your children or your friends see how temperamental you are, guess what? They either want nothing to do with you or you're going to be saying a lot of I'm sorry's. Who wants to do that? Or you'll just act like it never happened. That's worse. How many of us are moody? Gotta love the moody people. <laughs> moody is not good. And it is terrible to hang around with. Like, if, you're in a, if you get your morning coffee, you're happy. If you don't get your morning coffee, coffee, listen, people, I love coffee, but I don't let coffee rule me. And there are people that wear shirts, don't talk to me until I get my coffee. I just want to, I just want to love you through it. But I want to say, how weak can you be? If it's, if, if it's only coffee that makes you be like that, we're in big trouble. Nothing should rule our attitude or our behavior. Not one thing, not one person, not one thing. I don't care if it's your boyfriend, your husband, your kids. I've told this story a lot. I, you know that Love Dare book? Like our ladies group, I don't know, it was like 17 years ago or something, that Love Dare movie came out. I don't watch any of the movies, but um, we did the book for our ladies Bible study, and all these women were doing it for their husbands. And I'm like... I really have a problem with Tom. He's pretty easy for me to love. But you know what? It's a day-to-day -day task for me to love my children. So I'm going to do the Love Dare book for my children. <laughs> and I did. Whatever that book said, I did for my kids. It didn't change a daggum thing. I'm going to just tell you. <laughs> Don't buy a book and hope that it changes anything. Except for Dare to Discipline. I will, I will tell you, Dare to Discipline. Listen, that's a good book. How many of you guys are easily shaken? Like, I've been all these things in life. I'll be honest, I, I've been temperamental. Like, when I was not in the world, listen, you looked at me the wrong way, it might go down. I mean, I'm not kidding you. Uh, it might not be pretty. It's words are going to be spoken, our hands are going to be exchanged. I was very temperamental. Moody was my middle name. I get it. Easily shaken. How many when the finances, when it's getting real tight and you just don't know where that money's going to come in, we're easily moved or easily shaken by the bank account. You don't have to live like that. You don't have to live like that. How many of you guys aren't honest about things? All these things matter. And all these things will either make you or break you. It's the truth. There are people that... I love this. I, I don't really love it, but you're late for work, and you'll say, there was traffic. There was traffic, and there's traffic every day, okay? 
And it wasn't traffic that made you late. It's because you left 10 to 15 minutes late because you just had to do one more thing at the house before you left. Or there's the cat pooped on the floor, which is my life, you know? Always one thing, right? That's not honest. The honest thing is, is to either be on time or to say, I'm late because I made myself late. How many times do we don't want to go to a gathering so we'll make up that we're too busy? You're not too busy. You're going to sit on the couch and you're going to watch something, right? Or you're going to now make sure that you're busy when you weren't busy before so that you don't lie. You're lying because when you said you were, were, you were busy, you didn't have anything, right? Just say no. I don't want to go. Okay, you might lose a friend, but at least you'll be honest. I mean, if somebody has an ugly baby, you don't say they're cute. You don't. Listen, God loved my daughter, but she was not the prettiest thing when she was born. Okay? And literally, people would go, oh, man, she's beautiful. And I'm thinking, you freaking liar. I know you're lying. Her aunt even said she's not attractive. All right? Come on. There are ways to say something, like if I say to you, and if you have, you have a baby, and it's not the most attractive thing, I'm going to go, oh, look at you. Oh, you did a good job. Okay, if I say that to you, your child's not cute. Okay? But that doesn't mean we're not going to love the child, and we're not going to cater to the child. It just means at this moment in time, it's not a cute baby. And I ain't going to tell you it is. Hypocrites, if you want to raise a child that does not serve the Lord, be a hypocrite. Do as I say, not as I do. There's one rule in the set of the house, and then another set of rules for you. In our home, when, I, when we raised our children, if our children could not watch it, we did not watch it. If our children could not drink it, we did not drink it. If our children could not read it, we did not read it. There was not a, we have a set of rules, you have a set of rules. The whole house lived by the same set of rules. If we can't say it, you can't say it. If you can't do it, we can't do it. That was the set of rules that was applied. When your children watch you, you've told them no, but then you go and do it, guess what's going to happen? They're going to go and do it everything that you said not to do, and then some. Because it's truth. Generationally, it gets worse and worse and worse. Same set of rules. Do not be a hypocrite. Do your children see you praying? Do your children see you reading the Word? Do your children see you speaking in tongues? Do your children see you worship? I remember Tom was in his office, and he was praying and he was praying in tongues, and Tommy was probably, I don't know, seven, comes out, hey, dad's in there, he's speaking Spanish. <laughs> and I'm like, your dad took three years of Spanish and he can't speak it, so that must be tongues. <laughs> Trust me, there ain't no way he's speaking Spanish. That would be your spiritual language, son. Yeah. Let's go to Romans 16, 12 through 15. Paul writes to the Roman church. And right away, he starts out by telling the church to greet people. And I'm not kidding you when I say how you raise your children or how you behave will affect people around you and who they become. Get this. Greet Tryphena and Tryphosia, who have labored in the Lord. Greet the beloved Persis, who labored much in the Lord. Greet Rufus, chosen in the Lord, and his mother and mine. Greet Esencritus, Philogon, Hermas, Patrobus, Hermes, and the brethren who are with them. I should have spoken tongues saying all of those, and it would have made a lot more sense. Greek, greet Philogos, I don't know what that is, and joy, who, who hated their children? I mean, who names their kids these names? You have to hate your kids. Julia, I love that name, Nereus and her sister, and Olympus, and all the saints who are with them. I want you to look at something, it's something super interesting. When you study the word, 
it brings the scriptures to life. There's one person in particular that is so interesting. Go back to 13. It says, greet Rufus chosen in the Lord and his mother and mine. Who was Rufus? Scholars believe Rufus was the son of Simon of Cyrenian. Who was Simon of Cyrenian? Does anybody know? Simon of Cyrenian was only the man that carried the cross for Jesus on the day of crucifixion. What you do matters. How and what you do matters. What your kids see, what your grandchildren see, what your friends see matters. Because who you are today will probably have something to do with who they are tomorrow. It's that important. Being a new person. You, don't stay stagnant. Don't stay in the same place. It's got nothing for you. Become a new creature in Christ. Let's go forward. Um, friend, will you pass these out for me? Sometimes becoming that new creature in Christ, and we've already talked about faith, but sometimes being that new creature in Christ requires a lot of faith. Faith is huge. Faith is what saves you, right? Faith is what heals you, right? Faith is what gives you your provision because sometimes you're putting money in the tithe bucket and you're like, I ain't got that, but I'm going to give it because that's what God's called me to do or that's what I made for the week and I've spent all the rest of it on bills, but somehow, some way, God, you will provide, right? That's what faith is. Everybody's going to get one of these little packets. I'll just give you that one too. In the little packet, I want you to turn to Mark 4, 30 through 32. And I'm going to tell you to keep your finger in certain places because we're going back to certain places. The word never returns void. I could preach to you all day long or talk to you. I'm not really a preacher. I'm a teacher, right? I'm a teacher. Like, she's a preacher, like, she's going to come through here. She's going to go one side and down the other side and back the other side. She's going to make you laugh. But she, by the time she's done with you, you'll be sweaty on one side and sweaty on the other because she'll have worked you, right? I'm a teacher. I show things. <laughs> I don't like... That's why all three of us, like... Uh, Magal, so make you laugh. You're going to be laughing tomorrow. L why I believe, like last year, God specifically told me to have the three that came along with myself. And this year, Pastor Adonica, they're going to Africa and stuff like that. So for her, she wanted to come, but listen, they're out there winning the lost. You know, they're doing their thing. God bless them. They're going to get that million, million souls. In order to become a new you, you must have faith as a mustard seed. Everybody got one? Okay. <clears throat> that, that, that seed ain't very big. <laughs> it's astonishing, astonishingly small. The parable of the mustard seed. And then he said, to what shall we liken the kingdom of God? Or with, with what parable shall we picture it? It is like a mustard seed, which when it is sown on the ground is smaller than all the seeds on earth, but when it is sown, it grows up and it becomes greater than all the herbs and, the shoots, out and shoots out large branches so that the birds of the air must nest under its shade. Keep your finger here. Let's go to Matthew 17, 20. So God likens, or Jesus in the parable, likens the kingdom of heaven like the mustard seed. Can somebody get Adalis another packet? She seems to have lost her mustard seed. <laughs> Listen, it ain't, I know. We won't be finding that thing either. <laughs> Give up. It's like a needle in a haystack. It's not going to happen. All, but all you need, he likens the kingdom of heaven like a mustard seed. But all you have to have is faith that small. That's it. Faith that small. All of us can get faith that small. We all have the same measure of faith, but we all don't use that measure in the same way, in the same, in the same amount, right? We all say, well, he's got a mighty, he's a mighty man of God. He has more faith than me. No, no, 
He has, no, he has no more faith than you. He just uses his measure more than you do. That's all there is to it. God is fair. Matthew 17, 20 says, For surely I say to you, if, if you have faith as a mustard seed, you will say to this mountain, move from here to there, and it will move and nothing will be impossible for you. So, all things are possible to those who believe, right? All you got to do is have the faith of a mustard seed. Let's go. Keep your finger there. Let's go to Mark eleven twenty three through 24. Mustard size faith. That's it. Mark eleven twenty three 23 through 24 says, For surely I say to you, whoever says to this mountain, be removed and be cast into the sea, and does not doubt in his heart, but believes that those things he says will be done. He will have whatever he says. Therefore I say to you, whatever things you ask when you pray, believe that you receive them and you will have them. Amen. All you have to do is believe that whatever God's saying that you are, are what he's called you to be. All you have to have is a mustard size measure of faith to walk it out. That means you don't listen to the naysayers. That means you don't listen to the critics. You look at the mustard seed and you have the measure of faith that it takes to get the job done, right? So let me tell you about this. So when Jesus um, told the parable about the mustard seed at that time in Israel, that was actually the smallest seed. Now there are more smaller seeds, but that one was. That, must, that mustard seed can grow up to 10 feet high where birds can nest, right? And if you go over to Israel, that actually, that mustard plant is the most feared plant there is. And the reason it's most feared is it's like, how many of you guys love palmetto bushes? Okay, you, can't, you cannot get rid of a palmetto bush if your life depended on it, right? Well, same thing with the mustard seed, I mean the mustard plant. You can't burn it, you can't tear it out, you can't stomp it out, you can't do anything. Once it takes root, it spreads, and it is feared in Israel. Well, let's think about that. If, if, if the scripture says, to what shall we liken the kingdom of heaven, which Mark 4, 30 through 32 says, it is like a mustard seed, which when it is sown on the ground, it is smaller than the seeds on earth. So when you get saved, that seed is planted. Now it depends on how far. It's just like the parable of the sower with the different seeds that fall on the different ground. It depends on how far you let that seed grow. And let me just tell you, if you let that seed grow, you should be feared. You should be feared just like that mustard, that mustard plant. Because when it takes root, you can't stomp it out. You can't burn it out. You can't tear it out. You'll never tear the kingdom of heaven out of you. You are his. Now, I will take it a step forward. How many, how many of you guys have children that are, have walked away from God? That you raised in the church? Let's go here. Because this should bring you hope. And that's why this goes with what I was just telling you about the mustard plant being the kingdom of heaven or kingdom of God. This coincides with Proverbs 22, 6. Train up a child in the way that it should go. A way that it should go. And when it grows old, it will not depart from it. Right? If you raised your child in church, that plant is in there. That seed is in there. Nobody, they can try as hard as they want to. They cannot tear it out. They cannot burn it out. They cannot stomp it out. That seed is there. That plant is there. That child's coming back. The kingdom of heaven lives in them, and they're coming back. Amen? Don't look at what your eyes see. Just look at what the word says. Amen? The other great thing is, if you go to Israel, how many of you guys have ever been blessed to go to Israel? Gosh, it's awesome. If you haven't, well, it's a, it's a little crazy right now and all over the country. But if ever the world comes down and you want to go, I would still go. But because nothing by any means will harm you, Psalm 91. But um, if you go to Israel, it is, it is great. On the Mount of Olives, Jesus taught a lot of parables on the Mount of Olives. And the reason he did that is rabbis back in the day, they would teach to your five sentence, five sentence, senses. Um which is what we do when you homeschool, right? It's what your eyes see, it's touch, feel, whatever. Hold on, I have them right here. 
because even though I homeschooled my kids, I obviously didn't teach the five senses. <laughs> I tried. I don't know where it's at. But you teach the five senses. So they did it because the people were super simple, right? And so women were not educated, and the men were educated, but still they were very simple people. So rabbis always taught simplistically. If you go to the Mount of Olives, and on a clear day, you can see Mount Herodium off in the distance. Let's go to Matthew 17, 20. It says, For surely I say to you, if you have faith as a mustard seed, you will say to this mountain, move from here to there, and it will move, and nothing will be impossible for you. So there's also mustard plants up on the um, Mount of Olives. They're everywhere. I've been there. They're there. So you have the mustard plant, and you have Mount Herodium off in the distance, right? But then you can see the Dead Sea, all at the same location. So let's look at Mark eleven twenty three. For assuredly I say to you, whoever says to this mountain, it didn't say whoever says to a mountain, it says to this mountain. So scholars and rabbis especially, rabbis believe that Jesus was on the Mount of Olives and he knew the mustard plant and he knew the strength that it carried and the seed of the size of it. They believe that he said, if you say to this mountain, and he pointed to Mount Herodium, be cast and removed, be removed and cast into the sea. And then he pointed to the Dead Sea. What lives in the, in the Dead Sea? Nothing. Nothing can live. And does not doubt in his heart, but believes that those things he says will be done. He will have whatever he says. So if you say to that Mount Herodium, be cast into the sea, the Dead Sea, you'll have whatever you say. Cancer is gone. Diabetes is gone. Depression is gone. Anxiety is gone. Anything that you are walking through, poverty is gone in the name of Jesus. You say to that mountain, be cast into the sea, and it will be done. Amen. Size of a mustard seed. Amen? Amen. Amen. So, I love that. How many of you guys... How, how many of you guys ever listened to old timers, preachers, old timers? The best thing that you can do is, and I say there's very few new timers. Uh, I mean, Pastor Rodney's an old timer as far as he's been around for so long, but he's pretty young. I'll be honest with you. He's, he's only uh, four years old, five years older than me. So, he, but he's been doing this a long time. But I'm talking about people like Kenneth Hagin, people like that. They're no longer with us. Um, Lester Summerall, right? If you have not listened to these guys, turn off your daggum TV. It's worthless. What you can get in 30 minutes of not watching Everybody Loves Raymond, <laughs> King of Queens, or God forbid, what's that one where the people are like 90 day fiance? Yeah. <laughs> Like, that seems to be popular. Or like The Bachelor or something like that. I don't know. What you can gain for your personal being versus watching that crap. Okay. I love the story that Lester Summerall talks about. And if you've ever heard his life, truly, truly amazing. Because when he did what he did, there was actually no phones. I, the, the, there may be a wiring, but even everything that he did literally was a walk by faith. He had to hear the voice of the Lord and put into action what he says. We are, we, again, we have it a lot easier than a lot of these guys, and we don't even accomplish half of what they did because laziness, fear, um, just insecurity, whatever it may be. But, like, again, I, I, this is crazy, but literally people would rather die. This is a statistic. Rather die of drowning than public speaking. It's truth. Not kidding. People would, they, they're so fearful of speaking in public that when a, when a survey was done, they literally said, I'd, I'd rather drown. <laughs> That's crazy. Just go up and do what Adalis said the very first time, Pastor Adalis uh, did when she went up and preached the very first time. I'm done. <laughs> I'm done. After she, got, after she said a few words, hey, listen, at, at least she said something. 
Faith is an act. This is what he teaches. Faith is an act. And if you ever listen to him, I'm going to try and get his story as best as I possibly can. If you ever listen to him, he'll probably, you'll probably hear him tell this story. But he says, faith is an act. And I might follow it so that I don't screw it up because it's so powerful. When you act, it shows your trust in Jesus. If you say you have faith, then your actions will show, right? And it'll show how much you trust what God has told you to do. So with Lester Samaral, when he was 20 years old, the Lord told him to go overseas. And he went, and he was going to go to Australia. He was going to do missions around the world. And he only had $12 to his name, which $12 is a little bit of money. But let's face it, that ain't a lot of money to go over across the world. So he, didn't think, he said he didn't think about his finances, but he knew that God had called him to do what he told him to do. So this is what he says. That's called faith. When you don't look at the money, that's called faith. Faith is an act. You don't wait until you have the money for it. When God says to do it or how far you can trust Jesus, the extent of your faith is how far you trust Jesus, not by the things like him, like him saying, I only have $12, God. And then God giving him the money. That's not faith. Faith is, I only have $12, God, but I'm going to go and do it. That's actions. Actions show how much you have faith and trust in what God has told you to do. When you get, when you get action and then you, when you walk it out, you get experience, right? And experience creates knowledge, right? And when you have knowledge, you have more faith. So, so he heads to Australia and he preaches at a very large church. And this very large church actually thought he was very wealthy. Everybody always thought he was wealthy because he always took very good care of himself, right? My grandmother used to tell me they had nothing. But she said as long as she washed her dress and washed her drawers, then she was like better than most. And she always looked like she had something because she was clean, right? You don't have to have a lot, but take care of what you have, right? And, it's, and actually, lots of people don't take care of what they have, but they always want more. It's like, how can God honor you with more when you don't take care of what you have? We're to be a good steward of what we've been given. Amen? So the whole entire time he's there for the whole entire week, not one offering is taken for him because they think he's rich. They don't think he needs it. But he did in a big way. So the next day, he gets done with that whole week. The next day, he's heading off to a meeting. And that meeting was 100 miles away. And he had no money. So he's pretty much like, I don't know what, God, you told me to do it. I don't know how it's going to happen. But I'm not leaving this room until I, I have the train tickets in my hand. So he got up. He got dressed. He packed a suitcase. He put his briefcase and his suitcase by the door. And he was ready to go. That's faith. How many of us would sit and wait for the train ticket, then pack our bags, and then get ready to go. That's not, that's not what God called us, calls us to do. He says, you be ready, and then I will take care of it, right? It's all actions. It's all faith. So he likes to say, God says, you do your part. I'll do my part. If you won't, I don't, right? He told God, I will die in this room. I am not leaving. I am not going down and begging for tickets. I'm not doing anything. I'll die in this room until you provide. And he said he realized when all this was going on, and it wasn't until he was much older, he realized that God was testing him in this time. He was testing him to see, do you believe? And if, do you believe I've called you? And if times get tough, are you going to quit? Because if you can't do it now, you won't be able to do it later. So you might as well not even go move forward, right? So sometimes God's testing us to see how much we have faith in him. And our actions prove that. They show that. So the lady of the house comes, knocks on the door, and invites him to breakfast. He's like, no, thank you. I'm not coming down. A while later, another knock on the door comes. And it's this man. He's hysterical. He is crying. Now, Lester Summerall said he'd been crying all night too, but not for the same reason. And he's like, I'm a, I was 20, so I can cry. Like, he was scared. This man was crying, 
and he was saying, like, I've been up all night, and all of a sudden, Lester Summerall, nice man, but he's like, I don't really care. What's your problem? Have you had a fight with your wife? What's the deal? The man told him, God's had me up all night, and he told me, you don't understand how our train system works. You have to buy your ticket in advance, and you're a rich man, and I don't want to insult you, but you're a rich man. We all know you're a rich man, and like, but you don't know how our train system works. So you have to have your ticket. There's two tickets. You have to have a ticket for your seat. You have to have a ticket for the train. If you don't have those tickets, you can't just go buy them and get on the train. You have to have them in advance. I bought you these tickets. But if I'm wrong and I didn't hear God, I am never serving him again. And Lester Summerall jumped for joy. Those, he said those two men were as giddy as women waving and flapping their hands, he said. And they both knew that actions show faith. Faith shows trust, right? That's important. How far you're willing to act is how far you trust on what God has told you to do. And that's really what he wants from each and every single one of us. How much do you trust me? And how far you trust him will show how far he'll take you. Because actions matter, right? Let me move forward. I'm ahead of myself. Um, How many of you guys need faith for finances? Amen. You don't have to raise your hand. I've been there. But I will tell you, I've been there where I needed faith for finances, but I never worried about it. And you know why I never worried about it? Because I paid my tithe. If you pay your tithe, there are promises. I never worried about provision. I just have been there, but the righteous will never be seen begging for bread, and I knew that. Let's go to Leviticus 25, 1 through 7. I'm going to blow your mind with something. How many of you guys know that there is a day of Sabbath? There was a Sabbath day back in the day. We don't really, I mean, some people do it on Saturday, some people do it on Sunday, but nobody like totally collapses and rests on Sunday. Whatever. Whatever. I mean, people are, don't like that. They get religious about it. But as long as you have one day you observe, I don't think you need to lay down and do absolutely nothing for the rest of the day. I don't think I'm capable of it. <laughs> I'll be honest with you. I'd go crazy. But there was a Sabbath year. I mean, a, sa- a Sabbath on the seventh day. And then there was a sabbatical year, which is every seven years. Now, what is that? Let's read. Leviticus 25, 1 through 7 says, The Sabbath of the seventh year. And the Lord spoke to Moses on Mount Sinai, saying, Speak to the children of Israel and say to them, When you come into the land which I give you, then the land shall keep a Sabbath to the Lord. Six years you shall sow your field, and six years you shall prune your vineyard and gather its fruit. But in the seventh year there shall be a Sabbath of solemn rest for the land, a Sabbath to the Lord. So they're not going to work for a whole year. What the heck? How are you going to eat? You shall neither sow your field nor prune your vineyard. What grows of its own accord of your harvest, you shall not reap nor gather the grapes of your un, un, untended vine, for it is a year of rest for the land. So not only do they get rest, but the land needs rest, right? And the Sabbath produce of the land shall be a food for you, for you, your male and your female servants, your hired man, and the stranger who dwells with you. For your livestock and the beast that are in your land, all its produce shall be for food. Now, go to Exodus 23, 10 through 12. Keep your finger on Leviticus, because we're going back. Lots of Bible. And I have a reason for lots of Bible. Exodus 23, 10 through 12 says, Six years you shall sow your land and gather in its, pro- in its produce. But the seventh year... You shall let it rest and lie fallow, that the poor of your people may eat, and what they leave, the beasts of the field may eat. In like manner, you shall do your vineyard and your olive grove. Six days you shall do your work, and on the seventh day you shall rest, that your oxen and your donkey may rest, and the son of your female servant and the stranger may be refreshed. It's the same thing, right? Let's go back to Leviticus 25 through 20. You're going to say to me, well, if they... If they don't do anything in the seventh year, how are they going to eat? How are they going to eat in the eighth, and how are they going to eat in the ninth? How's that work? We're going to find out. 
And you say, Leviticus 25, 20 through 23, 22 says, and if you say, what shall we eat in the seventh year? Since we shall not sow nor gather in our produce, then I will command my blessing on you in the sixth year. And it will bring forth produce enough for three years. Praise the Lord. And you shall sow in the eighth year and eat old produce, produce until the ninth year, until its produce comes in, and you shall eat of the old harvest. God not only provided for the seventh and the eighth, right? So, so many people will say, listen, you don't know my bills. You don't know what I'm walking through. You have no idea. You don't know my rent. You don't live my life. Well, I think the Israelites did. Because they were told for one year, do nothing. And when you do nothing, I will give you three years to, of provision. I think God's got you covered. Because we live in a far better covenant than what they had. Far better. Let's go to Malachi 3.10. Malachi is the last book of the Bible before you get to the New Testament, if that helps anybody. Malachi 3.10. If you don't have faith for your finances, you're crazy. You're crazy. Be free, because you are not your provider. He is. Al Shaddai. He is your provider. Malachi 3.10 says, Bring all the tithes into the storehouse, that there may be food in my house. So he's saying, bring all the tithes into my church, into where you're being fed. And try me now in this. And this is the only place, this is the only place that God tells you to try him, to test him. That's it. And if he says you can test him, then that means he's coming through. Says the Lord of hosts. Try me now in this, says the Lord of hosts. If I will not open for you the windows of heaven. What's in heaven? Streets of gold. A cattle on a thousand hills. As many jewels and diamonds and as far as the eye can see, wealth, mansions, and pour out for you such a blessing that there will, be not, there will not be room enough to receive it. Test him. If you want new, start with you, but start with your finances, start with your family. It will radically, radically change your whole world. I'm not kidding you. I look at Logan. Logan's been saved for two years. Yeah, one year, because she got, she's, she was coming, listen to this, she was coming to the church for a year, and it took your husband to get her saved. Not Tom, <laughs> but your husband, right, Logan? Logan comes to uh, the week that Jonathan was here. She gets saved. She had been trying to get pregnant, trying. She, they basically said, you're going to have to go to infertility, it's not going to happen for you. Tom laid hands on her. She's pregnant. How, how far along are you? One year. How far along are you? 22 weeks. She gets saved by not her pastor, by an evangelist pastor. She gets her womb open by her pastor. Like many people, listen, people are only like, I can only listen to her. I can only, no. Listen, sometimes we are going to say things and do things. Like, I love, I love Andrew Womack, okay? I love him, but there are some things about him that he says I do not agree with. I chew up the meat and I spit out the bones, okay? There is something you can get from almost anybody unless they're preaching something antithetical to Scripture, okay? She, in one year... She's gone from two incomes to one income and radically pays her tithe and radically seen provision come in in ways that she never dreamt possible. It happens, people, but it happens if you act in faith, if you trust in what the Word says. Amen? Actions equals trust. That's how it works. So I want to I wanna encourage you, if you don't pay your tithe, how many of you guys are old enough to to know, try it, you'll like it. The old Alka-Seltzer commercial, try it, you'll like it, right? I'm telling you, try it, you'll like it. It's way better than Alka-Seltzer, let me tell you. I've drank plenty of it. It stinks. 
but tithing's great. And I don't know what's happened with Sarah over there, but whatever. Um, let's see. What time is it? We're getting close. Let me, I'm going to skip. I will tell you this. How many of you guys are believing for a new home or you're trying to rebuild from the hurricane? I mean, we're a hot mess and it's almost a year later, right? Pay your tithes, okay? Me and Tom, when, when we wanted a new home, we dreamed that we would live on at least an acre and we always wanted a pond in the back and we wanted it to be somewhat secluded so our kids could rip and run the streets without having to worry about, you know, crazy people. And so we stood, we stood pretty fastly on what we were believing for, but you know, sometimes your income, you sit there and go, how is that possible? And I'm gonna tell you, this is how it's possible. I tried to take shortcuts and God kept telling me, no, wait, no. And I would even say, I'll compromise. I'll take the acre without the pond in the back, <laughs> no wait. And then the land came for a price that was fair, that we found, the, we did our own homework, we found the land, we called the owner, they said yes. And I'm like, okay, I got my acre, I got my pond. And I had worked for a builder, but let's face it, I had not stayed at a Holiday Inn Express just yet, so I wasn't a full contractor. And if I had stayed at the Holiday Inn Express, I would be able to know how to, to build a house, but I hadn't yet. So I sold Tom on the idea, I can build this house all by myself. And then our friend said, well, we want to live out there too. I can build your house too. They're like, really? We could save so much money if we did it ourselves." So I was like, okay, I'm going to do this. Never filed a permit before in my life. Didn't know squat. But listen, all things are possible for those who believe. I am more than a conqueror in Christ. <laughs> so, 20 years ago, I was a youngin, and I really didn't grow up knowing the word no. And I would have strongly advised you to grow up and get rid of the I can't, I don't know how. Because listen, if you have God and he tells you to do something, which I knew, he said, this is your land. Okay, I don't know how to build, but I know what my finances are, so I know that he'll help me get the house that we want with the money that we have. We just might not do it the conventional way. We ended up finding his, his friend was a contractor. He said, oh, I'll let you borrow my contractor's license. I'm like, okay, first battle's over. Learned how to do the permitting process, learned how to do the architectural stuff. By the time it was all said and done, I was a hot mess, but I got my house. And I got it for far less. The pool was worse than building the house. I'm just saying to you though, do things, and it may not be the conventional way, it's just like starting the church. Has God called you to do the ministry? And are you afraid to step out and do the ministry? Okay, if he's told you to do it, he will make it happen for you. It may, it's an action. You take the first step, he'll take the next. If you don't, he won't. Remember that. Faith equals trust. That's all there is to it. If he's called you to do something, your knees may be knocking and you may be afraid. But I can tell you, you do it. Because in the end, if he's called you to do it, you'll be successful. If you miss it, it'll be all right. Because you, he looks at the heart and he knows what your heart was behind it. He'll fix it. He'll put things back together and it'll be all right. No egg on the face, no nothing. It's all okay. But it's when you don't do something that there's regret. Don't live with regret. Let's look at, um, I, I love this. I hate quitters. How many of you guys love quitters? <laughs> and when I say I hate, I mean, I like Jesus hate quitters. I don't think I, outside of lying, I don't think I, I think I hate quitting the most. And there's reasons why I hate quitting, because most of the time, just before you get to the victory, you quit. And you would have gotten the victory. And you're robbed. Satan steals from you, right? So remember this. Quitters never are victorious, ever. 
They never will. And who never becomes what God's called them to be? Quitters. They never amount to, not that they don't amount to anything. They don't amount to what he's got for them when you quit. And in today's society, we believe like there are no trophies. Everybody's a winner and it's okay if you quit. Okay, but that's not what God's word says. Actually, it's opposite. Philippians 4.13 says, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Write these down. Galatians 6, 9 says, and let us not grow weary while doing good, for in due season we shall reap if we do not lose heart. 1 Corinthians says, 9, 24 says, do you not know that in a race all the runners run, runners run, but only one receives the prize, so run that you may obtain it. Acts 20, 24 says, but none of these things move me, nor do I count my life dear to me, so that I may finish my race with joy and the ministry which I received from the Lord Jesus to testify to the gospel of the grace of God. Isaiah 41.10 says, Fear not, for I am with you. Be not dis dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you. Yes, I will help you. And I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. Amen. 1 Corinthians 16.13 6, says, Watch, stand fast in faith, and be brave, be strong. Here's the thing. So many times we, we count it as like honorable when we cave, when we condone, when we are like not, not the word meek in a way in which Jesus is meek or the Holy Spirit tells us to be meek. When we're weak, okay? But that's not what the word of God tells us to be. We're to stand strong. We're to be bold as a lion. We are to be steadfast in faith. So when this world goes crazy, you might be somebody's only hope, but if you embrace and endorse the lie that they're standing on or what they say you should be, you're not helping them. You're only going down the same road as them, and that road leads to destruction. There's nothing good. We are to be the restraining right? You cannot restrain and comply at the same time. It does not happen. So be victorious. Do not be a quitter. Walk in the word, right? Be washed in the water of the word and then become what it's called you to be. I don't know where Ty is. Oh, there's his little head, his little beaner. Hey, baby, can you put on some music for me? 1 Corinthians 15, 8 says, Therefore, my beloved brethren, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. Amen. Amen. It doesn't matter what you look like. It doesn't matter how smart you are. It doesn't matter how short you are. It doesn't matter how tall you are. You can be all that you're called to be for your family, if you're single, if you're married, if you have kids, if you don't have kids, everybody is always like, I don't really want to go to that because I'm not married. I don't really want to go to that because I don't have kids. Who cares? You bring you and then you bring something to that group. Amen. It doesn't matter if you fit in with them. If they're believers, you fit in. Amen. And your job for you. Be what he's called you to be for you. But most importantly, be what he's called you to be for ministry. Now listen, you can't be any of these things. You don't put the cart before the horse. You can't be any of these things if you're not saved. Okay? And a life without, without Jesus is just saying a life. It's not. I don't care what anybody says. Turn to John 8, 1 through 11. I'm going to tell you a beautiful story. I hope I make it without crying. I'll be honest with you. I don't cry over much. Family and Jesus, God. That's pretty much the only thing that makes me cry. Oh, and if I lose, sometimes if I lose. <laughs> Again, I've lost 11 pounds because Adalis and Magalis challenged me. And then I made three other people come alongside of me. That's right, girl, 11 pounds. Mm -hmm. I show you my calf muscles, but I don't want to get anybody hot and carried away. Glutes of steel. 
not true. I had no muscle whatsoever in this body at all. Like I was telling Magalis, I injured myself probably five times where I literally had to say, I'm, I'm out, I gotta stop for a minute. And then I had to go see the massage and the massage lady is not a massage like, oh, this feels so good. This massage lady, she digs deep and she hurts. I screamed like a man. Sorry, guys in the back. They're not going to catch you now because I, uh, I just busted their chops. Okay. John's, John 8, 1 through 11. And this is, listen, ladies. I haven't been here per se, but I've been here. This is a beautiful story. But Jesus went to the Mount of Olives. Now, early in the morning, he came again into the temple, and all the people came to him, and he sat down and taught them. Then the scribes and the Pharisees brought to him a woman caught in adultery. And when they had set her in the midst, they said to him, Teacher, this woman was caught in adultery in the very act. And now Moses in the law commanded us that such should be stoned. But what do you say? This they said, testing him, that they might have something on which to accuse him. But Jesus stooped down and wrote on the ground with his finger, as though he did not hear. So when they continued asking him, he raised himself up and said to them, He who is without sin among you, let him throw a stone at her first. And again he stooped down and wrote on the ground. Twice he stoops down and he writes. And then those who heard it, being convicted by their conscience, went out one by one, beginning with the oldest even to the last. And Jesus was left alone and the woman standing in the midst. When Jesus had raised himself up and saw no one on the woman, he said to her, Woman, where are those accusers of yours? Has no one condemned you? And she said, No one, Lord. And, the, and Jesus said to her, Neither do I condemn you. Go and sin no more. Now, there's lots of theories. A lot of scholars and rabbis believe different things. But I will tell you this. This part is true. The Pharisees and the Sadducees, they were trying to trip Jesus up. And what they were trying to do is if Jesus said, stone her, then he would look like he was cruel, right? And he would be abiding by the law, right? If he said, don't stone her, then he is not abiding by the law, and then he is wrong for that. And he knew that because he knew the law. He didn't want to violate it, but at the same time, he knew what they were trying to do to him. Now, there's some people that believe um, that when Jesus, let me see what the scripture. Oh, this is true. He tried to turn the tables on them. So Jesus tries to turn the tables on them when he said, he who is without sin among you, let him throw a stone at it first. Four things Jesus did, right? He knelt down. He wrote in the dirt, he wrote down, he wrote twice, and he specifically wrote in the dirt, right? And that's not five. I have a cramp in my finger, <laughs> my thumb. I obviously need water. There's four things, but I have a cramp. <laughs> so many theologians, sorry people, it's, it's real. I like literally impressing my thumb because my thumb hurts. Um, all that working out has made me dehydrated. No, I actually have fasted all day. <laughs> and I can drink as much water as I want, but it's not going to help. So, um, a lot of people think that when Jesus wrote it in the dirt, that he was writing down the sins of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. They believe that maybe he wrote down their adulterous affairs and the names of the women, okay? But rabbis believe something completely different. And I will tell you, I tend to believe more like they did. Because it falls in line, I'll tell you. Jesus wrote in the dirt two times as a reminder to these leaders that the Israelites were led out of Egypt. On Mount Sinai, God gave them the Ten Commandments. And he wrote the Ten Commandments on the tablet with his finger. Right? And then when... When Moses came down, what were the Israelites doing? They were worshiping an idol. And biblically speaking, worshiping an idol 
was as bad as committing adultery. Okay? It's the same in the Lord's eyes. So Moses, he smashed those tablets, and then he went back up the mountain. And then he had to beg God not to destroy them, right? In which case, God did. And then Moses came down with another set of tablets, the Ten Commandments, right? The second, second set of stone tablets. Do you know what day that was when that happened? That was the Day of Atonement. Do you know what the Day of Atonement is? The Day of Atonement is the holiest of holies. That is when the high priest goes in and he sprinkles blood on the mercy seat, which is on the ark. And that was one day a year that this would happen so that the Lord's grace and mercy and forgiveness would be for the Israelite people. The day that Jesus got down on the dirt and he wrote his finger, into the, the, wrote his finger in the dirt, that was just after the Day of Atonement. And basically what he was saying to these Pharisees and Sadducees is, your people did no different than her. If God forgave you, if God forgave our people, we can forgive her. She does not deserve to be stoned. Amen? Now what's beautiful is God's mercy is wonderful. He doesn't just give us a second chance a third chance, a fourth chance. I've been there. I can't tell you how many times I said, God, forgive me. And probably on the third try is when it actually took. Some of us are more hard-headed than others. That's just a fact. But you have two options in this life, and God is a beautiful God because he gives us choices. The one choice is live like the world. Pay the consequences. But he is not forcing you to him. He is a gentleman. Second option is Revelation 3.20. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in to him and dine with him and he with me. And what I ask you this, just tonight is, how many of you guys are ready to dine with him? <laughs>